Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. Welcome to Everything Co-op this beautiful Thursday morning. And we have Heather Gray on the line with us this morning. She is an activist, a journalist, and a media specialist. Good morning, Heather. Good morning to you. Thank you. Thank you for being on and taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us. So I just, I'm going to get started by just asking you, where did you grow up and what kind of education did you get? <laughs> That's a broad question, but okay, so I'm originally I'm from Canada, from Western Canada. And uh, my father brought us down to Atlanta, Georgia in the 1950s, actually. So I was raised in, in Atlanta, Georgia, in the South. So that's the start. Where, where do I go from there? My education, mm-hmm. I uh, have uh, an undergraduate degree in, um, in anthropology and a master's degree in sociology. So, um, and I got that both at Emory University here in Atlanta and also at Georgia State University. So that's my education. But that mm-hmm. was the academic education. My real education was living in the South and learning more about uh, Jim Crow because I was raised in the Jim Crow era, right, and mm-hmm. uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. So that that preoccupied me altogether as a young white uh, girl, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> So and and so as far as the civil rights movement was concerned that I ultimately did get involved in, my first day in the United States in the 1950s, I woke up on the Emory University campus. It was my first day in the U.S. I looked out the window and I saw this exquisitely beautiful black woman. She was standing in the corner um, of the road, just out the window when I was looking out the window from the alumni building where we stayed at, in, in the Emory campus. And um, she was wearing these bright, beautiful clothes. She walked with such grace. And I thought, oh, my goodness. And Vernon, in Western Canada, as a child, I never saw anybody black. This is the first time I ever saw anyone black, right? Mm-hmm. And she she is what people refer to as a burning bush. She was my burning bush. She laid the groundwork for my life altogether mm. because... I realized that black folks were treated differently in Atlanta. I thought, what on earth is happening here? So, and uh, so as a child, I began to explore all the various aspects of Jim Crow, trying to figure this crazy thing out. Well, before you go any further, so your first day you're at Emory, so was your, was your father or mother working at, at the campus? My father was teaching at Emory. He was going to teach at Emory. He was in the Dallas School. He was a dentist. Okay, so he's yeah. a, a dentist. They come out of Canada, Western Canada, and what city is that? Okay, so we're from Alberta, okay. um, Edmonton, Alberta. And let me just tell you, Bernhard, is that my father? Yes, he was a dentist. He graduated from the University of Alberta in dentistry, but in the 1930s, he worked in the Arctic Ocean, actually, and um, so he was working on a barge as a dentist and treating Eskimos and Native Canadians. And he was, you know, on the barge, there was no electricity, so he was pumping, you know, with his foot to get the drill to work. And um, so he realized altogether with that experience and other experiences that the drill need to be improved upon. And so he thought if he came to the United States, he might be able to get some resources to do that research, which he did. Mm -hmm. Actually, my father is known as the father of the high-speed drill. He developed it in the 1950s. He tried all these different experiments and so forth and came up with a drill. And so, um, so yeah, he's known as the father of the high-speed drill. In the 1950s, he was traveling all over the country, uh, all over the U.S., trying to encourage uh, dentists to use this higher-speed drill. 
<laughs> I cannot even imagine sitting in a dental chair and the dentist is pumping his foot on the I know. to make the gr- I know. drill go and then drilling in my teeth and having to keep everything together. With, yeah, that, that is. <laughs> Yeah, okay, that's the picture I don't even really want to get into. But you're in <laughs> 1950s, you're at Emory, and you look out and see this beautiful black woman with all of these gorgeous colors uh, of clothes walking with grace. And and I, I guess from that you're asking the question, because you've never seen blacks in Alberta, so is it, who is this and how they operate, and then you learn about Jim Crow. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. And so the, the, the interesting thing is later on, too, um, you know, as I began to explore all of this and I was just trying to figure out everything um, when I was in the 10th grade. It's interesting, this dialogue that we're now having say, with Bernie Sanders and so forth uh, on socialism versus capitalism. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, in the 10th grade, I was given a history assignment. And I remember to this day also Sitting in the library, the sun was streaming through the window, and in the Encyclopedia Britannica, I discovered Karl Marx. Now, Marx, at the age of 16, at my age of 16, told me that people are treated differently for profit. And everything fell into place for me at that point as well. Um, so there, those were two critical moments in my growing up years. And then I started looking more at economic systems, which, of course, will lead us to the discussion of property as ultimately today. But... Uh, but that those were seminal moments in my in my growing up. At the age of sixteen, I wrote a fifty page paper on this concept. I'm sure I did a terrible job, Vernon. I wouldn't know what I was doing. Um, and later on, I saw my teacher actually, um, who was not that much older than me. Mm-hmm. I saw him not too long ago, actually, Mr. Morgan, Robert Morgan was his name. I said, Mr. Morgan, you remember that paper I wrote when I was 60? Oh, yes, Heather, I remember that He did paper. today? Oh, my God. Okay, so it had an impact on him to be able to remember that. Um, <laughs> it's probably because I did a terrible job on it. <laughs> oh, I'm probably sure it wasn't that. So he, he, i got to go back, though, to the study of anthropology. I hear about this, and I happen to look it up. Like, what do you really study when you study anthropology? So... You, you've got a black woman that influenced you, grace and beauty, and then Karl Marx to understand about beginning to get an understanding of capitalism and profit. So what did you study in anthropology? Uh, well, in anthropology, um, you know, of course, my most memorable experiences were reading Margaret Mead. But, you know, you study different cultures and you study the differences between cultures. It was just really so incredibly instructive for me because, okay, so yes, born in Canada and then coming here, but I was interested in other cultures as well. And I became more interested, of course, through Jim Crow, a better understanding of the politics in countries. So um, so cultures and politics and so forth, you know, were all just sort of intriguing to me. So... I don't know where else to go with that. Okay, that's, no, that's, it's, I got the study of humans, human behavior in societies in the past and present. So you're studying these different cultures. What, is, what does it mean to be human and how humans interact and how these different cultures set up? And that then took you to the study of uh, sociology. And I just wanted to get into this a little bit more because I, I've heard about these degrees, but I really did not understand them. I was math and chemistry, so I didn't get into much of any of this in undergrad. And then a, mas- a master's in mathematics, none of this. But I did want to under- – I, I, st- I was in a doctoral program, and I got out with a master's of math because I wanted to understand about people. And we didn't do that in math. And then eventually I got an MBA, which – with organizational behavior and theory, I got into beginning to look at how organizations work, but not from an anthropological standpoint of who are humans and what, how have we operated in the past and in the present. And then you go into sociology, which is the study of social life, social change, and the social causes and consequences of human behavior. So what's the consequences of anthropology? All right. So... Is that sort of fit into what you 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 were learning, or what are the major kinds of things that you get out of that study that set your life pattern? Yes, it just set my life pattern. But you know, my my work in sociology 
I ended up doing a lot of research for various professors, both at Emory University and Georgia State University, and looking, doing research interviewing uh, immigrants, actually. I ended up doing a number of interviews, uh, interviews with, with um, folks who had to be in Vietnam during the war and so forth. Anyway, I just, it was just, and then also interviewing students. You know, let you be interested in this as far as a cooperative perspective is concerned. What I found was that the Chinese students, for example, tend to study together. And as I began to learn more about the, because I've lived amongst the Chinese, I lived in Singapore for a while, actually. So the I learned about Confucius and the importance of education, Vernon, which was also very instructive for me. Because the Chinese really do value education, and not just for the wiki to learn, but everybody to learn. Education should be for everyone, in the, regardless of class or whatever. And uh, what I discovered is that the Chinese students will study together, and it's okay if you don't know something, right? You could say, I don't understand this concept, and that's okay. Everybody accepts it, and then they just dialogue amongst themselves, right, as a group. Americans don't do that. They tend to study on their own on the whole. Although I do understand now that um, that uh, in some universities, some professors are encouraging group study. But anyway, I just wanted to mention that as, as what was really instructive for me uh, as I began doing more research. And then I had a remarkable time interviewing a number of of the immigrants just generally. It was it was very instructive in, in any number of ways to, to learn the different cultures and how they're adapting here in the United States and so forth. So, so as a young child, Sorry? your first as a young child, your first day in the U.S. at Emory, you see this black woman and then that starts you to question Jim Crow. So did you study this Jim Crow era and how it started and what it was all about in studying anthropology or sociology? No, well, I didn't study Jim Crow specifically, although I mean, in those classes, I was doing that on my own, studying it. But um, I will say, though, that learning about the different cultures, uh, particularly, I studied a lot of Margaret Mead's work, and she came to Emory once and spoke, which was just absolutely wonderful. I so appreciated her work, which helped me to also better understand Jim Crow, I think. Okay. I mean, I, if you're going to ask me how to explain that, it might take a minute for me to no, I'm not sure that no. I could do that, actually. But For me, but it, it was it, very, growing sorry? up in Bluefield, West Virginia, and being under Jim Crow, it was just a way that the people in power try to keep blacks out of power and in low jobs without education and not able to vote. They just keep people Absolute, out. Yeah, absolutely. So, to me, that was, okay, slavery is gone. Now, how do we keep control? At one point, we could tell them what to do and how to do it and when to do it and where to do it and not have to pay them much. Slavery has gone. And now folks started voting and getting blacks elected and the people in power said, oh, we don't want this. So they in, incorporated these Jim Crow laws and stuff. OK, I, I got that. <laughs> we, well, I think I think that one of the things as far as Jim Crow is concerned or, or white America and European America on the whole has been a desire to control, you know, and so everything, everyone, that's disconcerting. And I keep trying to better understand this concept, right? We've got to take a break. I'm sorry. And that's a great place to break. That. No, go ahead. No problem. So we're going to take get the music, the weather and traffic, and we'll be right back. Please don't touch that down. Your news talk station. Information is power. That's why WL is a great partner. Although, in the first month in this program, six and a half years ago, the the uh, gentleman from Senegal said that it's not information that's power, it's putting that information to action. And so we are giving you information about cooperatives. And right now we have Heather Gray on the line with us who's talking. We talked about anthropology and sociology and coming from Canada. And she came from Canada and got introduced into Jim Crow and in Georgia growing up in 
in Georgia. So you said right before the break, Heather, that Americans and Europeans have a desire to control not just blacks through Jim Crow, but everything. It's been your experience of this culture. <laughs> I think so, yeah. Okay. I mean, it, you, you see that through the colonial experience wherever they are. And, yeah, it's really important. We have to go into a whole dialogue about European history. That's one of the reasons as far as property development is concerned, Vernon. I'm so appreciative of some of the the activities and policies in the Scandinavian area in Europe. Um, and, of course, in other parts of Europe as well, like Montezuma and Spain and so forth. But but I do want to mention, in during that break, you were talking about also the uh, fellow from Senegal who was talking about the importance of action. And, you know, I was exploring also the possibility of going for a Ph.D., but I realized that all my research, the people with Ph.D., I mean, okay, I appreciate people getting having more knowledge and you know, and so forth, and, and getting into various university positions. But I realized that most people with PhDs, they'll, send, they'll do a lot of research on the right articles, and they're not necessarily all that involved in the community. And I thought, I didn't want to do that. I just, I wanted to get involved. I wanted to get involved in community activities and activism and so forth. So I didn't go that route. I didn't go the PhD route precisely for that reason, actually. Action, get into community activity. So where, where did you exactly. go from getting your degrees then? What did you do? Uh, and say that again, I'm sorry. Um, after but, you got your degrees, what kinds of actions did you get into? Community uh, involvement, community action. Well, yeah, so I was working on my degrees, and I, I, I became involved in, in 1967, for example, from Atlanta. I went up to the, the 67 March against the Pentagon. Uh, that was remarkable. I, I just I started getting involved with various student uh, activities and actions and so forth, and other folks in the community here in Atlanta who were concerned about about the war, certainly, but also about Jim Crow policies. I need to say that in 1968, in the early part of uh, the first week of of April of 1968, early in that week. I was asked by a friend of mine who was teaching at Spelman College, which is the black women's college here in Atlanta, a part of the Atlanta University complex. She said, Heather, why don't you come to this event we're having this next weekend at Spelman and spend the night on the Spelman campus? I said, okay, that's great. I'd love, love to do that. And then a few days later, on April the 4th, Martin Luther King was assassinated. And when I woke up on the Emory campus, Vernon, his body was in State and Sisters Chapel, which is the it's, it's the chapel on the Selman uh, campus. It's a very large chapel that has two aisles that you go in, that you can walk in one one aisle and then walk out the other, go to the front and then walk out the other. And um, when I woke up in the campus, Dr. King's body was in State and Sisters Chapel. So I wanted to pay my respects to the great man, and I stood in line with these people as they were walking into the chapel. I was the only white person in line, I need to say. Mm -hmm. But all you could hear were the shuffling of feet and people crying, you know. And we, I went into the chapel, and his body was in state at the front of the chapel with an open coffin, right? And mm -hmm. there were pastors on either side of, of his coffin, and they were wiping off the top of his of the coffin. And later on, one of the pastors who I knew, you know, I said, why were you all doing that? Uh, he was one of the pastors by the coffin. He said, because as people were walking by the open coffin, they were crying and their tears were cascading on Dr. King's body. Mm -hmm. And so they decided they needed to put glass over the top of, of his body, of the coffin, right? And so that's the metaphor that I've used in some of the things I've written. What they were doing was wiping away the tears. Mm. So I then uh, participated in the funeral. I mean, I was driving for the Student on Violent Courting Committee to bring in people who were coming in for Dr. King's funeral. I was driving with some in my car in with some Atlanta University students. And the first person we picked up was Ralph Bunch, who was representing the United Nations, right? And we thought that uh, Ralph Bunch we thought he was the Secretary General of the UN at the time, sent Ralph Bunch because Johnson was sending Hubert Humphrey to the funeral, so he didn't want to 
overstepped his bounds here, I guess. So he sent Ralph Bunch. And so Ralph Bunch uh, did not want to go to a whiteout hotel. So we took him, and he was with his son, actually, to Pastels, which is one of the leading black uh, hotels here in Atlanta at the time. So then I just want to tell you that the next person I picked up for the funeral was Alard Lowenstein, who is a black attorney in the civil rights movement from New York. And so I picked him up and he said, right off the bat, Bernie, he wanted to visit Dr. Uh, Mrs. King. So I went to Dr. King's and, and Credit King's house and I stood outside as they went in to visit with Mrs. King as, as I was waiting. There were just crowds of people around Mrs. King's house. And uh, as I waited, for him to come out of the house, um, Sammy Davis Jr. walked out and Harry Belafonte walked out and it was just really something. And then he said to me, when Lowenstein came out, he said he wanted to visit um, Ralph Abernathy, Reverend Abernathy, who was taking over the position at SDLC uh, because he was the second in command, basically, at SDLC. And he had been with Dr. King when he was killed in Memphis. Mm-hmm. So... We went to Ralph Abernathy's house, and uh, when we walked in the house, uh, there were about four gentlemen in the living room just talking amongst themselves, and the reverend was resting. And Juanita Abernathy, his wife, was sitting in the kitchen on the phone, and so Alar Lowenstein knew uh, Mrs. Abernathy. We walked into the kitchen, and then Vernon, she got off the phone, and she took my hand, and she talked for about five minutes about what had happened, you know, with the assassination of Dr. King and how nervous she was for her husband now being in this position and so forth. You know, it's just, it was one of the most important five minutes of my entire life, I need mm. to say. And then Reverend Abernathy came out and, and greeted us. And then I took Lowenstein to a white owned hotel right? mm. <laughs> in Atlanta. But, um, and then I did march in the funeral the next day. You couldn't get into Ebenezer Baptist where the service took place, of course, or I couldn't anyway, but I then marched in the funeral. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's wow. another part of the Southern experience, right? Well, see, the, sure. the, what's so interesting is, I, like I said, I grew up in Bluefield, West Virginia, and in 68, I was a junior in college at Bluefield State, a historically black college. And my mother, though, I had a full scholarship to Clark College in Atlanta, and it was Clark College at the time, and both football and a- academics, and she would not let me go in 1965. And we argued that whole well, started before this summer, but that whole summer. And um, I don't know, she may have saved my life because, or I might have been right there, there with you. <laughs> I don't know, but yeah, that's so, so interesting. Yeah. Asked the question, what would my life have been like if I had been in Atlanta in 65 through 69 or 70? In- interesting. But, um, uh, okay, so you have such a rich history it's kind of like <laughs> what what would it well thank you what was it like to be like the only white person in that in that in the in that procession or driving all of these black folk around in your car and I assume there wasn't a lot of white people there it might have been but what was that like or does the Driving whiteness make any difference for, for, for the funeral for all of that whole that whole scene. The uh, well, I need, I need to say that, you know, the interesting thing about what was happening when Dr. King was assassinated is that there were riots all over the country. Mm-hmm. You know, black folks were rising up and rioting, and was, I certainly understand, actually. But we, we didn't see that so much in Atlanta. And I, I will say also that the city leadership and people all over the city were trying to do white, white and black and white white leadership in the city were trying to do what they could to help. And my parents were also picking up people at the airport, actually, as it turned out. Okay. Um, but as I was driving uh, Lowenstein and Dennis, who was with him, right, we were driving mm-hmm. to go to visit Ralph Abernathy. We were driving down Hunter Street, which is now Martin Luther King Jr. Drive. Uh, burning my car stalled. We have to take a break with the car stalled and come back. Okay. Okay. Um, All right. We'll take our second break 
And okay, I, thanks. You're, you're, it's such a great history. We, and we eventually we have to get over to talk about co-ops. But <laughs> we'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. This program is Everything Cooperative, and this is Vernon Oaks, and we have Heather Gray on the line with us, who has an extraordinary history. And Heather, we were not going to be able to get through all of this. <laughs> I, I, uh, I understand. So let, I, go ahead. No. I mean, I could shorten this a little bit. I do want to. I just want to say, though, as we were, as I was driving uh, Lawrenceine to Reverend Abernathy's house. My car stalled on Hunter mm-hmm. Street, which is now Martin Luther King Jr. Drive in Atlanta. And these young black, black youth, males, right, started rushing to the car and shaking it, right? Um, and because uh, we were, there were three whites, me and then Lowenstein and Dennis, you know, in the car. Mm-hmm. And uh, Lowenstein said to me, Heather, you have to get this car started. <laughs> And I said, tell me about it. All of a sudden, my car started. But, you know, yeah, I mean, there was just, it was really a difficult time for everyone, I, I need to say. Um, but let, let me just, as far as cooperative economy, and I, I know we need to be talking about cooperatives. That is what the show is about. But let me just say this. Six, let me, let me say this end before, of, before you okay. go. So I got that you live in Canada, U.S., Australia, Singapore, and the Philippines. And now you're, right. you're back in Atlanta, Georgia. So you have a wealth right. of history in living in all those places. And you also... Check the the voting in South Africa in '94. Uh, I did, yeah. So that's um, since a wealth of history, and I I get that I could talk to you on air or off air for two or three or four or five hours just because of what all you've done. But what I wanted to get to was you worked for the Federation of Southern Cooperatives in Atlanta, I think for twelve years. What was that like? And how? No, did you twenty-three get that? years. Twenty-three years. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, twenty three years from nineteen ninety one till yeah till the um, yeah two thousand thirteen. How long is twenty three years? Yeah, two thousand thirteen. <laughs> okay, two thousand thirteen. So yeah, no, but yeah, but I knew Ralph. Pay. I started working in nineteen ninety one with the Federation of Public Lives, but I knew Ralph and his work in the early nineteen eighties. Actually, so but yeah. Yeah, Ralph Page was uh, great. I was really he was sorry. He was the executive he director of the Federation, so he passed a few years ago. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, he's been on the show two or three times. He was on the yeah, first excellent. Thanksgiving. He came on Thanksgiving Day. Wonderful. That, yeah. That's great. Yeah. So, what was that like working for the Federation of Southern Co-ops? And well, let me for? let me just mention also before going into that, uh, the Vernon, because in the 1980s, I also worked for Coretta King. I directed the nonviolent program for her in the 1980s. Um, which was, I was just honored to do that. And that was also, you know, just learning about the whole nonviolent philosophy and so forth. And I've also written quite a bit about that as well. Was a good sort of intro in some ways to the cooperative economic development. Um, it's just people coming together and having a philosophy and understanding what their goals in life are, right? Which to me, also um, is what cooperative economic development is largely about as well. In fact, when I went to the Philippines, yes, I married an Australian and I lived, you know, my son was born in Australia and I lived all over Southeast Asia, it seems to me. Mm-hmm. But um, but when I was going to the Philippines, John Zippert, who uh, was one of the founding members of the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, who lives in Alabama, he said, Heather, what are you going to do when you come back from the Philippines? And I said, I don't know. He said, well, why don't you come to the Federation? So that's what I did. I called Ralph and I came back from the Philippines and I, I started uh, working with the Federation and I became the director of communications. I was just really honored to do this. But as director of communications, I started getting involved in a lot of other research projects also at the Federation. So um, so John, yeah. is, John has been on this program and he and his wife have become um, – Co-op Hall of Fame, the heroes of the cooperative movement. And I was absolutely amazed to find out that John Zippard was from New York because he sounds and talks and walks so Southern. <laughs> he reminded me of people from the South because he's been there so long. So it was just interesting to find out his history. Um, yeah. 
So he asked you to come back, and you came back to the Federation. So what's the purpose, you said, that Federation was economic development and working with black farmers? Yes, the Federation of Southern Cooperatives started in 1967, and it was created in 1967 to address the problems that black farmers have been having, basically. Um, but, uh, but you know, I know you've, you've had other Federation folks, of course, on your show. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, they were inspired by the Cooperative Economic Development work in Louisiana, actually. So um, that is what led to, well, I don't know. I mean, we could go into a, just a long history of this, right? Mm-hmm. But, but to realize that in order for farmers to be protected and to save land, basically, they had to come together. And this, of course, had to do with the huge discrimination that black farmers had experienced and the problems with holding on to land and so forth was just really critical. Uh, the other thing, though, uh, uh, Vernon, a lot of my work ultimately for a number of years was working on the black farmer lawsuit because of the Pickford lawsuit in the late 1990s because of the discrimination that black farmers had experienced from the U.S. Department of Agriculture itself. So it's been a long struggle, but the only way that we have been able to make progress is coming together, right? Coming together. So, yeah, exactly. With us, the, the Chinese students working together, studying together, getting more out of this this sort of, as a group, you can get much more done if you use each other's skills and knowledges and whatever resources, like financial resources that one might have. And that's why I like co-op so much. Um, and that education is critical in the cooperative, the fifth principle. I've taught for 12 years, Heather, and, uh, I, and my mother was a school teacher, so like like your father was. And so this sort of education was sort of ingrained in me. My grandfather said, Vernon, get an education boy, get an education. Whether he's sober or drunk, get an education boy, because that's the only thing the white man can't take from you. And uh, that was sort of, uh, that's been the thing of how always learning, always learning, always learning, always learning. Okay. Yeah, excellent, excellent. I I appreciate that philosophy, actually. So I, one, one of the things, you know, we're talking about cooperatives, and I work at the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. Mm-hmm. I remember there was... Um, um, a gathering. This was in Alabama. Now, the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, as I know your listeners would know, has a thousand acre training center in West Alabama, which has just been a remarkable location, actually, for any number of important events and teaching sessions and so forth, as far as cooperative economic development is concerned. But there was a, a gathering that we had once with some funders, actually. We went to visit a credit union in West Alabama. And I remember how this fellow from the Ford Foundation was so impressed because the director of the credit union, which is also a, 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 an entity that is of a, a cooperative mm-hmm. um, philosophy, um, was saying that there they had homeless folks in the community who were members of the credit union and would donate money to the credit union when they could, right? Mm. And so the director of this credit union said when this homeless fellow asked for a loan, the guy said, we, of course, gave it to him because he's part of our community. And, you know, the, the Ford Foundation fellow <laughs> was just stunned at this. <laughs> and I thought it was just it was just such a Perfect. beautiful gesture and, and action on the part of that credit union because they all knew each other. This was a part of a a commune, a community, right? Mm-hmm. And um, so I just wanted to share that. It was, that's it was a, that's a great, great story. Um, so there are four types of co-ops real quick. It depends on who owns and controls the business. If it's owned and controlled by the employees, it's called a worker co-op. So any business could be a worker co-op. If it's owned and controlled by the people that uses the products or services, it's called a consumer co-op. Credit unions is a consumer co-op. Housing uh, co-ops are consumer co-ops because the people that use those products and services own it, like that homeless person was a part of the ownership. Um, and then 
uh, if uh, some groups that will get together and form a purchasing co-op. Farmers do that. Artists are beginning to do that. And, and so that they form a company who gets to be expert at what seed you need, what fertilizer, gas, equipment, and then the, so that the farmers can get a better deal because they're buying in volume and they have knowledge about it. And then farmers and artists and other people are also called uh, the fourth type is purchasing co-op, and sometimes they're called producer co-ops, where milk farmers will come together and they'll form this business like Cabot Creamery or Organic Valley, and they put send all of their milk and this produce cheese and cottage cheese and all of the different milk products and get it to markets that they couldn't get it, that the farmer couldn't get it to, and they normally have a better price. So co-ops work in a lot, a lot of different ways. You'll like this. There's a there's a group in Pittsburgh, uh, Heather, that's black women uh, who are artists, and they, they do jewelry and paintings and carvings, uh, and they got together and formed this co-op that they got a storefront so they could sell their products together. Any individual artist couldn't do it, but as a group, and they have some great, great products. And they also buy from other female artists throughout the world and sell it throughout their... Through oh, that's their, wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. It's, it's, and it's called Ujama, which means cooperative, so <laughs> cooperative business enterprise. So, it, yeah, it is wonderful, and this is why how people can come together and use their resources and their skills and get more accomplished as a group, whether it's studying together or forming a business or creating jobs or solving some community problem through this co-op, and that's why National Co-op Bank sponsors this, and I'm so excited about doing this program. And we got to have you on two or three more times. I got to tell you that right now because <laughs> you, you, you had so much history. I would love to talk about. What well, did you? Well, thank get? you, Vernon. Thanks for sharing all of that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, what did you get? So I, of, I do. I do. Want, I do want to mention, as far as cooperatives are concerned, you know, it provides the opportunity for so much as you were saying, as far as the the uh, uh, women artists, right? Um, for example, there was, I'm trying to remember now, it was quite a few years ago, but anyway, some kind of major uh, company was wanting to purchase some crops, right? And so what what folks in Mississippi were able to do was to collaborate with a number of farmers uh, in, who were associated with their cooperative, right, individual farmers in order to fulfill this market demand. I mean, it just, it provides just so many opportunities. It's just, it, it, I'm always just so appreciative and astounded at so much of this, you know. So they all knew each other. They had worked together. Um, and so, and they could reach out to other farmers as well who might have wanted to join in this market venture. So, yeah, they're just wonderful examples of, of people coming together and, advancing opportunities in in the marketplace, period. <laughs> so Ben Burkett is the rep from the Federation from Mississippi, and I've had him on the program. He's a very quiet, unassuming man. And when I <laughs> met him, he had on his you know, coveralls with the things you put up under the, the fingers. And he just doesn't. And when you get a chance, you get him to talk, it's like, Awesome. So whether it's sweet potatoes where you got this huge order, any one farmer can't do it. You need 10 or 20 farmers to produce the sweet potatoes to send up north Chicago or New York or somewhere or watermelons or what have you. Working together, they could get in to sell their products that they couldn't do individually and also get a better price. It's a phenomenal kinds of stories that I've heard him talk about and Cornelius Blanding there at the Federation now exactly. took over exactly. from Ralph, who's nice young man that's doing a lot of great stuff there. Yeah. Okay. So I thought when I was talking about Mississippi bird and it was it was Ben Burkett and the Indian Indian Springs Farmers Cooperative that I was referring to actually. Okay. It was Ben who took the lead in all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I've which had makes, a, sense, right? <laughs> I've had a chance to meet him and I'm just so amazed and honored to to hear him talk and yeah. so forth. Yeah. Once you can get right. him to talk. And we got to take our final break. But the last time I was with him was at the Cooperative Impact in D.C. that the NCBA, National Cooperative Business Association, puts on every year. Uh, this is Co-op Impact and what's the impact on our economy and, and, and also the world. Love to see you up here on that. We'll be right back. We're taking our final break and talk about voting. We'll be right back. news 
Business Talk Station. Information is power. The National Corp Bank is sponsoring this program. Their mission is to support American cooperatives and their members uh, and any other organization that's social responsible by providing financial services, and particularly in low-income communities. So NC, the NCB has been around since the mid-'80s, and they've been doing a great job of working with low-income communities where often you will find black and brown people. Um, Heather, the this is Black History Month, and the 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 theme this year is African Americans and the vote. I go back to you said that more often when uh, Europeans come out over and take any particular country, or they will want to desire to control everything. Absolutely, I find it interesting that they'll want to put in place democracy, which is the second principle of cooperation. Cooperative is one member, one vote, not based on how much money you have, but just if you are a member, you have the same vote as any other member, which is one of the other reasons I like co-ops. But w- th- these Europeans want to put in a democracy, but then they want to control stuff. So how have you seen that play both in your study and your travel to all of these different places? Um, th- th- this whole thing of vote. Well, and Europeans, uh, wherever they've gone, whether it's to Australia, whether it's, you know, in, in Indonesia, in the Philippines, in Singapore, in Canada, you name it. One, they want to take the land, that's for sure. They want to control the land. Uh, and on the African continent, I mean, wherever Europeans have gone, they've done basically the same thing. But they want to control the land, they want to control... The economy, they want to control everything. Um, so, um, well, I mean, that they, they tried, they've tried to do that everywhere. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, but, but certainly, as far as the democratic system is concerned, yeah, they want to control the vote. So the interesting thing to me is that whenever there's been a serious effort to try to develop something like, um, uh, you know, I always say, actually, if there was ever a successful war in the world, Vernon, it had to be the Cold War, because it stopped people from even having a dialogue about economic systems. Um, so we're seeing this, the same um, impact of that with uh, having a discussion about socialism. Let me let me just say quickly, also, I just sent an article about this recently, because I've had a few people saying this, and one of my friends in Atlanta, Rashi Harry, who's a renowned urban farmer, he said, Heather, you realize that Trump is a socialist, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And a socialist in the sense that he has a collaborative effort with all the other wealthy people, and they try to control everything. They don't do anything really without talking with each other. And also they have been able to purchase Congress in so many ways. Yes. Through, you know, uh, Citizens United case that made corporations persons. It's just ridiculous. But anyway, so, yeah, um, as far as the vote is concerned, it's, so incredibly important, but there are efforts to try to undermine that in every conceivable way. And, you know, there's a long history of the FBI getting involved and also trying to to destroy groups and individuals who, who spoke out against this oppression on the part of the, the a lot of the wealthy folks in America, what can I say? Mm-hmm. And, and corporations altogether, yeah. I mean, Dr. King was one of them. He, he was wanting to see better salaries and so forth and worker rights um, it, when he was in Memphis. That's what he was working on. And he um, was killed because of that. You know, they didn't want that kind of a powerful voice in support of workers. So, so I don't know. Where are we going with this? Well, well it's, it's interesting. It's interesting that uh, what you're saying with my not even having to ask you is that my belief was Dr. King – was sort of like the establishment put up with them. They they looked, the FBI was always looking to see and then calling them communists and all of these things. But when he started look, talking about the economic things, the war in Vietnam and then uh, getting salaries, you know, you always had this struggle between the rich and the poor or between the barons and the peasants. Um, and no matter what culture you're in, and when he then takes up for the peasants or the poor and says, you got to pay them more, that's when he got killed. 
And so it's to me that was just sort of, no, we're not going to do this. So I do, I do worry about Reverend Barber, who's taken that up. What I would like to, if I could get to Reverend Barber, is which I've tried several times and try to get him on a program, is he has a political answer of getting folks in elected. And I believe that co-ops is the economic answer to poor people because they get a chance to make new money. And it's a, it, it turns out to be a social a socialist, socialist business because the people own the business, they own the production, they own what's produced, and then they own the profits. And they say what it is. That's what a co-op does. So co-ops to me is the answer for poor and marginalized people, of which I never learned in, in the MBA program at Stanford. I didn't learn anything about co-ops. It was all about right. corporates and return on investments. Right, right, right. So getting better salaries and worker rights is what Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders Sanders were talking about last night in their whole programs. Uh, And then you got the people in the middle and then you got the billionaire on the other side of it. I don't know what he's talking about. Let me let me let me just say, you know, it's it's one of the reasons why I appreciate your program, Vernon, because you're having a dialogue about about these issues, because, as I said, because of the Cold War, people have just simply not been able to dialogue about economic systems, period. I mean, even, well, let me, let me just mention to you also, I have a radio show in Atlanta on WRG Atlanta, which is also a, an affiliate uh, station of the, of the Pacifica uh, network, but affiliate in that we, we're independently owned here in Atlanta, but we, community owned actually, but we do take some of the Pacifica programs. But, one of the people that I've interviewed over the years is um, Richard Wolf, who is a renowned Marxist economist. He went to Harvard. He said Harvard tried to make him into a good capitalist, but didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he was also recently very impressed with Mondragon. He went to Mondragon. So he's talking a lot about cooperative economic development now. But he said that when the Occupy movement took place in New York a few years ago, mm-hmm that it just transformed people's attitude toward the work he was doing because people realized from that movement the huge economic inequities, as in the 1% versus the 99%, which is just outrageous, really. And he said people just started walking to his lectures since then, which is a good thing Mm -hmm. because we just need to dialogue about this. I mean, you know, it's interesting to me the New Deal that Roosevelt came up with to address the Depression, right? Which was, to me, what he developed was a mixed economy, where there were all kinds of programs to benefit the masses of the people. And yet, the, the corporations were able to do basically whatever they still wanted to do. But to me, that was, I call that a mixed economy. But anyway, I know our time is just going quickly here, and we could probably dialogue about so much of this. But all right, so as Dr. King would say, Vernon, where do we go from here? Well, that, that is the, the, the question of, of the future. What do we do from here? Because we've we've got to get people out to vote, got to go vote, got to go vote. And whenever I hear mostly a young person, sometimes an older African-American say, my vote don't count. It's like, you got to get out of that. You got to go vote for somebody because we really, the Trump policies are going, are hurting us and they will continue to hurt us. The next one year, and if we if we get five years of him, I don't know what we're going to look like or what the world's going to look like. No, I completely agree. That's that's scary stuff. But yes, people need to vote. Absolutely, there's just no question about that. The power of the vote is it's just remarkable, really. And it took so long also to be able to get that right to vote in the United States for the masses of the people. Yeah, people have to vote. There's no question. <laughs> so. Yeah, people people died to get the right to vote. That's the oh, African Americans, uh, Native Americans, women, and, and it was uh, so always so interesting to me that it was the white male and and also in your landowners. Yeah, so your white male landowners. If you didn't own land, you couldn't vote in England. So. It was, it was, yeah, we want democracy, but only for this class of people and everybody else can't participate in democracy. So we got that right now and people have fought for that right and died for that right and lost their homes and all kinds of things. So people got to go vote. That's, that's the future to me. That's where we go now. How do we, what we do? 
Let me just mention one of the good things that's happened recently, actually, uh, because uh, Brian Kemp, who was the Secretary of State here, who is now the governor of Georgia, and probably the governor because of the outrageous things he did when he was Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. But they took all kinds of folks off the voting roll. Purging. Um, like yep. They sent notices to people and so forth about, you know, their vote and so forth. And they did, if they didn't answer this response, then they were taken off the voting rolls. I mean, it's more, more complicated than that. But there was a lawsuit uh, brought by um, Greg Pallas, actually, um, who was the one who discovered the hanging chads in Florida, right? Anyway, they were successful in this um, lawsuit against Kemp to get access to all the names of the people who had been taken off the voting roll. So uh, this, was a, this was a huge victory. In fact, the federal uh, uh, judge in this case said there was no need to go to trial because Kemp's case was so incredibly weak. <laughs> okay. So, so this is a good sign. So, um, there are, there is some progress here, certainly in the state of Georgia. We're we're hoping that this is going to have a huge impact on this upcoming election. But Heather, yes, people need to vote. People died in order to vote. It's absolutely true. We've got to go, and I truly thank you for being on with with us today. And I want to get you back on, and also maybe come to your show to talk about co-ops and the benefits of. I know. Oh, I'd love to do that. Okay. I'd love to do that. Thank you so much. Brian. Thank you so much, Heather. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Your news talk station.